The International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute, IBA HRI, working with the global legal community to promote and protect human rights and the independence of the legal profession worldwide. The legal profession defends the rights of citizens, facilitates access to justice, ensures accountability of the state and upholds the rule of law. When the legal profession is not able to function effectively or independently, then this gives rise to human rights violations, impunity and violence. In some cases, judges and lawyers are missing the vital tools to advocate for the rights of citizens. In others, they are harassed, physically attacked and detained simply for doing their job. The Human Rights Institute of the International Bar Association was created in 1995 and uh, uh, HRI's mandate is to promote and support uh, human rights uh, as well as to uh, promote and support the independence of the legal profession under a just uh, rule of law and it has played such a crucial role for the International Bar Association. The reason why the International Bar Association's Institute of Human Rights can step into areas that um, perhaps other NGOs and other organizations can't is because it has that great weight and heft that comes from belonging to an organization that brings together such incredible lawyering and judging from around the world. And that gives it convening power, it gives it influence, it gives it prestige, and it means that lawyers and judges um, are prepared to engage with us. The Human Rights Institute works all over the world. Uh, we've done over 200 projects in 75 jurisdictions. We undertake human rights training programs, we run fact-finding missions, we do trial observations. We work together with the legal profession for the practical implementation of human rights. Training and capacity building. We do capacity building with the legal profession and with bar associations so that uh, they are sustainable and effective organisations for the promotion of the rule of law. Afghanistan. IBA had a very important and vital role in the creation of the Afghan Bar Association. We started working in Afghanistan in 2005 and uh, it was a long process and we employed eight uh, legal consultants. I remember uh, Liliana, Alex and Philin, Philip, uh, they came uh, a number of times to Afghanistan and with the help of our uh, you know, defence lawyers we were able to create the Afghan Bar Association. When we first started the project, there were only 100 registered lawyers in all of Afghanistan. There are now over two and a half thousand. We were able to get agreement from the lawyers in Afghanistan when we were in the stages of setting up the Bar Association that there should be adequate representation of women. And as a result of that, in the bylaws of the Bar Association, it expressly states that of the two vice presidents of the bar, at least one must be a woman. Also in the bylaws, it is a requirement that all lawyers undertake three cases pro bono each year. I'm very hopeful that the future of the bar, uh, with the help of the uh, International Bar um, Association, uh, will be very good for Afghanistan. Myanmar. In Myanmar, we did a fact-finding mission, and as part of the report on that fact-finding mission, uh, some of the recommendations related to setting up a national bar. During the military regime, there were some regional bar associations. They were all illegal organisations. Post the military regime, we are working with the stakeholders on the ground to establish a national bar. This means working with the legal profession, uh, with Aung San Suu Kyi, 
uh, with other politicians, uh, with the Attorney General and with other NGOs in order to get consensus for a national bar to be established and to get it properly registered and uh, properly running. Tunisia. We've been doing incredibly good work all around the world, but I've loved the project in Tunisia. I mean, Tunisia is one of the places where there, you know, we really can be hopeful um, that the Arab Spring will actually bring some flowering and, uh, and not just a summer, but a, but a whole kind of set of seasons because the, the development there has been towards really proper, fully-fledged democracy. We've been doing wonderful training there. 800 judges have gone through a training programme and uh, and you've got to remember that when when people have been judges in systems where basically which were authoritarian and the idea of a judge making a decision that might be, be criticizing of the government it just couldn't happen and so these judges have been hungry to learn how do you be how can you be a judge in a democracy it's been such a great success story for um, the human rights institute but i think it's it's what the it's what the international bar association can do that often other organizations can't. In-country fact-finding. We have generated reports uh, that have uh, been of interest in identifying what needs to be done, in identifying the persons that we can work in collaboration with. Egypt. We were receiving reports of draft legislation that was being introduced during Morsi's regime that would have lowered the retirement age of judges from 70 to 60. This in itself would have forced about 3,000 judges into retirement. That's an issue which threatens the independence of the judiciary. We held over 25 meetings with over 40 individual stakeholders. So when we spoke to lawyers, they gave us some examples of cases where there was a controversial ruling and the judge was moved. And while during the mission we couldn't verify these particular anecdotes, we did find that on a review of the laws, um, there are issues that, that could be improved. We hope to see both judges and prosecutors playing a positive role uh, in this new Egypt where uh, that the state can both account for violations of the past but also uh, better protect the rights of all citizens. Trial monitoring and advocacy. In some jurisdictions you find that uh, the law itself requires infusion of human rights values and in other jurisdictions the law is fine, I mean the law is reasonably okay but its administration requires attention uh, there is a need to attend to fair trial standards, for instance, in many of the jurisdictions where we have worked. Venezuela. Bueno, como abogado de la jueza Fiuni, las dificultades que hemos tenido son inmensas, o sea, desde persecución eh, política, persecución personal, o sea, se nos ha tratado de evitar que ejerzamos la profesión de abogados, pero nosotros seguimos en la lucha por una autonomía del Poder Judicial. Sino que son jueces nombrados a dedo por el Ejecutivo Nacional, que responde a los intereses del Ejecutivo Nacional. Por supuesto que nos ayuda para poder saber que el trabajo que estamos haciendo aquí algún día va a salir a la luz pública y se va a saber que fue un, un, un buen trabajo y además de eso, definitivamente, la observación de Rivari o de International Bar Association en los juicios, tanto de la doctora Maduro de Pini como en el juicio en mi contra, eh, ha sido muy importante. International Task Forces Task Force on Illicit Financial Flows, Poverty and Human Rights our argument is that both tax evasion as well as tax avoidance can amount to a breach of human rights because they contribute towards poverty in many countries in the world. An NGO called Global Financial Integrity, which made some estimates according to which around a trillion dollars a year is flowing out of developing countries uh, due to trade mispricing, corporate shenanigans, but also embezzlement that is aided and abetted by tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions. Somewhere around 15% of global wealth is sitting uh, completely untaxed in secrecy jurisdictions. There is a very important responsibility on the part of these very powerful agents and their helpers to desist from trying to manipulate the, the rules. We traditionally looked at human rights violations uh, 
uh, as uh, violations by governments. Uh, we have looked at, uh, at mainly at uh, political rights. The work of the task force looks at a wider range of rights, including socio-economic rights, and uh, also looks at uh, the possible contribution of corporates uh, and tax administrators or governments uh, to violations of human rights. The great merit of this task force is that it got, comes forward with a lot of expertise and says, these are, if you're really serious, if you really want to solve this problem, this is what you have to do. Task Force on International Terrorism. The Terrorism Task Force was created after 9-11. The IBA was probably the first international, uh, certainly the first international legal organization that had uh, created this type of task force. We brought in the really top scholars in this field and we were able to set forth recommendations on how do you, how do you counter uh, uh, terrorism but to do so without losing uh, the principle of human rights. All this work is aimed at ensuring that we promote, support, enforce human rights, the rule of law, uh, independence of lawyers and judges throughout the world. When you look at what HRI does and you look at the areas that it focuses on, time and time again it touches on the crucial issues dealing with the rule of law and human rights in every part of the world. It is about bringing home why the rule of law matters, why safeguard, safeguards for citizens are vital in a, in a democracy. And, uh, and the world will trade with you, the world will do business with you, you will have the respect of the world if you're delivering those other things. And that democracy is nothing without the rule of law and the protection of human rights. <laughs>